when we review studies, they're often sold as, wow, this study shows that this professional is just as good as a physician. But when you read the fine print, you learn that that's there's a lot of caveats. So this study that came out in 2020, it was actually online. It didn't make it into real print, and we'll talk about why. Uh, and it was called Radiology Extenders Impact on Thoroughput Q2 and Accuracy for Routine Chest Radiographs. So they're just chest right. x-rays. They have two radiology assistants or radiology techs that they ask to do a preliminary read. And then they have two resident physicians that are in training. Do they say how far along in their training they were? They did not, no. Okay, so we don't know if they're very junior or if they're about to graduate, we have no idea. Yeah. Also remember that you know re residents are there, they're working, but they're also there to learn. So they're doing very thorough, you would hope evaluation and maybe they have to look something up or read about something. So we're not talking about fully fledged radiologists were talking about in training and they were simply looking at chest x-rays and then the senior physicians, the attending physicians then overread all of the x-rays and then they analyzed how fast were those x-rays able to be processed and completely read, meaning read first by the preliminary and then by the attending, and then how many errors were made by the uh, assistants versus the residents. So right. what they concluded was that the radiology assistants speeded up the process and they, they claimed that without significant difference in results. But Phil, what you're saying is that there were differences in the results. Can you go over that again? They had a, a second group of people look over the final interpretations. Six of the 186 that they reviewed had significant errors, three of which were judged to possibly be dangerous. Importantly, these studies from what they wrote were all overread by the faculty. So these errors were not caught by the faculty, which says something about how closely they were overread. There was one study uh, of the resonant group that was judged to be a significant error, but not a dangerous one. Now, th these are really small numbers. And they claim not if this you're the patient, though, Phil. Like, if those, right. I'm sorry, but if those radiology assistants looked at a quote simple chest x rays, uh, supposedly, and three of them, three out of 186 interpretations were dangerously wrong, if I'm one of those three people, maybe I die. I mean, to me, that's a big deal. Yes, exactly. They used some statistics to say it wasn't significant, but I'm going to point out one other thing here. In their introduction, they note how important it was to them to save money by using these people, which is to say they are not uninterested arbiters. They are not skeptical scientists. They are promoting a business entity. Hey, there's maybe another um, bias about the involvement of the residents. I, I don't know if um, an attending told me I had to participate in something that I would feel that I could say no as a as a trainee, or I don't I don't know if they were um, informed about this, or or I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure if the details of how that occurred. So you're exactly right, Sharon. And in fact, I want to give a lot of credit to Phil and one of his colleagues, who's also a board member and a radiologist, a board member of Physicians for Patient Protection, because when the two of them saw this study, they had grave concerns about it because of the, the flaws in it, but also because of the ethical question about involving residents, which are physicians, in training, and that ultimately what they said in their summary, and, and there was a headline that read, radiology extenders outperform radiology residents with chest x-ray interpretations. So basically, you're calling out those residents saying, look, somebody that barely got any training did better than you did. And they actually published the names of these residents, not in, in, in the body of the, of the article, but at the end in the acknowledgments, it put their names in there. So how is that supposed to, how, how can that not have a negative impact? I would be furious if I were the resident. It also was actually using human subjects, which were the residents, without their consent. 
and my colleague on the PPP board tried to get the paper pulled by talking to the editor of the journal, and there was no satisfaction there. She immediately wrote the provost of the university pointing out the ethical issue there, and within hours, the paper was offline. Yeah, it, so. it, it was such a, a victory, I would say, for physicians. And I want to give a lot of credit to Phil and to your colleague and to PPP because we sent this letter on behalf of our organization and it was penned by Phil and his colleague. I threw my name on there just because I'm the de facto president, although I didn't do any of the actual hard work of creating this document. But what Phil and the other board member did was went through point by point and shared the different ethical and, and other dilemmas that they found in this article. Number one, they tried to claim that this was a QI or quality improvement study instead of an actual research study, which it really was. And so that they claimed that because it was a QI that it should have received a IRB exemption, meaning it did not have to go through a board review process and that they didn't have to get all this you know, to consent. And there's, there's a regimen that you have to go through to experiment on human subjects. Yeah. And then number two, they failed to protect the identity of the research subjects, as we mentioned. The other thing that they said is that these residents couldn't exactly say no, because if they said no, that could have had a negative impact on their training, even though it shouldn't. We know that unfortunately, these things happen. So what was really amazing, as you mentioned, very quickly from when this letter was sent to the vice provost and also copies were sent to the research integrity officer at University of Pennsylvania. And very quickly, the article was pulled. It's no longer able to be seen online and it was not published in print. Although if you Google search it, you'll still see some news articles and headlines touting that radiology extenders can outperform resident physicians. But fortunately, we were able to get that article pulled and received a letter back from the University of Pennsylvania from the Senior Vice Provost for Research, uh, Don Bonnell. And what they wrote was, after carefully considering your letter, the University of Pennsylvania's Human Research Protection Program personnel, the last named author on the publication, and I continue to believe that the initiative conducted and reported in the article was properly interpreted as a QI initiative but they acknowledged that the verbal consent process was inadequate. And they said, considering the circumstances and out of respect for the participants, they have elected to formally withdraw the article the authors had. So it, it, even though they withdrew it, you can hear that they're, they're not really taking as much responsibility as we would have hoped. Sharon, what are your thoughts when you hear, when you heard about that response? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for the residents that it was taken out. I, I, I don't know from that response if they've really quite learned their lesson. I'm not quite sure if they won't try to do this in another way, in another form. So I am still a little concerned given their, their history. I'll say this, Dr. Jaw's presentation, of course, he's from the same section of the same institution, uh, came several months after that article was pulled. Their enthusiasm for doing this is no less. Uh, they didn't get a publication out of it. I don't think they care that much, but the important thing to them is the money, and they're going to keep going for it. 